This is Thursday, September 29th, 2011. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morris Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today Ronald Chuck Tiberio. Welcome, Chuck. Thank you. May I ask when you were born? I was born in Lemonster, Massachusetts in April of 1946. I was uh, one of the first post-war babies. Okay, and what is your, uh, do you currently live in Natick? I currently live in Natick, yes. Okay. And marital status? I've been married to my wonderful wife, Sheila, for 41 years. And do you have children? I have uh, two adult children. My daughter Stephanie is 40 mm -hmm. and lives in South Carolina with mm -hmm. her husband and my grandson. Mm -hmm. And my son Ron Jr. lives in Virginia with his uh, lovely wife Karen. And they have two children, Kylie and Trevor. Okay, so three grandchildren all together. Three grandchildren all together, mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Now, you were saying you were born in Lemonster, but you guys moved to Natick around 1957? That is correct. I was 11 years old. We mm -hmm. moved in, uh, the family moved in February. Mm -hmm. However, my folks made arrangements for me to spend February through June with my grandparents mm -hmm. so that I could finish the school year up there. Okay. I'd come to Natick on the weekends, but I lived up there. Yeah. What was it like uh, living in Lemonster at that time? Well, to be honest, Lemonster back then was a factory town and it was a very factionalized town. Uh, I lived in a section called French Hill, mm -hmm. which was mostly French people. There was the Irish section, black section. There was Lincoln Terrace, which was the Italian section. And uh, my parents uh, sent me to a parochial school, but the Italian section didn't have a school, so I went to the Irish Catholic High School. Uh, elementary school, sorry, mm -hmm. St. Leo's. And what did your parents do for a living? Well, when I was uh, first born, my mother uh, had a part-time job at a place called Cluett Peabody. They were a subdivision of Arrow shirts, and she made collars on the shirts. However, she soon gave that up right after uh, I was born. Mm -hmm. My dad, uh, when I was born, was uh, still in the VA hospital recovering from war wounds. And when he finally got better, he uh, became a worker at uh, one of the plastics factories, mm -hmm. uh, Standard Tool Corporation, and they made molds for various plastic objects. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we moved to Natick, he went to work for his brother, who, did similar work, but instead with uh, metal. So mm -hmm. he became a sheet metal fabricator. And your father was Seth Tiberio. Yes. World War II veteran and also a participant in the Veterans Oral History Project. Yes. And before the interview, you were telling me how you came to be named Chuck. <laughs> how, how did you get to be named Chuck? Well, uh, I've never gotten the 100% full story on this, but as I've been told, I was a difficult birth and my mother was not um, mm -hmm. really able to say a lot uh, and my dad at the time was in the VA hospital. He didn't actually see me until I was about three or four months old. Mm -hmm. So the, the question really is who named me Ronald because uh, mm -hmm. nobody really knows that. When my dad first saw me, he thought I was a very chunky baby and he just gave me the nickname Chuck and it stuck. <laughs> so. so uh, why did you? Uh, why did your family move to Natick? Uh, my dad was in what could best be described as a dead end job. Uh, he was a young, uh, bright guy. He certainly was smart enough to get promoted, but there were two men ahead of him who were uh, entrenched in the job, and he had absolutely no way that he would make any more money where he was. Mm -hmm. And my uncle, his brother, uh, had a rather thriving sheet metal business that was starting to take off and uh, my dad moved the family here and started working for him and it turned out to be the best thing that ever happened uh, work-wise for him and also for us kids. Mm -hmm. So, so um, you moved to Natick. Uh, what part of Natick did you move to? We moved to uh, the big white house on the corner of Bacon and Oak Street, 51 Bacon, right across from Wilger School. Mm -hmm. 
That was one of the things my folks uh, said when we moved here. You'll be able to walk to school, which I did for one year. Of course, that was Lulger School. I went to sixth grade at Lulger, right. And uh, tell us what Natick was like uh, back then. Well, compared to Lemonster, it was uh, like night and day. Mm -hmm. uh, I told you that I, Lemonster was factionalized, and I really didn't have a whole lot of playmates because mm -hmm. uh, the kids tended to stay with uh, their own uh, group. And uh, like I said, it was French Hill, and it was mostly French people. If I wanted to play, I'd usually have to go about four or five blocks down the street to my cousins mm -hmm. uh, and play there. But when I moved to Natick, I remember uh, spring Saturday, I walked across the street to the playground at Lilja. There were about 10 kids playing ball there, and they didn't care if I was Italian, blue, or from Mars. They, I just fit right in, and I instantly had a ton of friends. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, it was a fabulous place to grow up. I had a terrific uh, childhood from about age 11 on. It was really wonderful. And uh, what uh, junior high school did you go to? Well, after Lulja, I went one year to Coolidge, which was a 7-8 school, 7-8-9 school at that mm -hmm. time. And then they finished the brand new Wilson, and I went to 8th and ninth grade at Wilson. And then I finally went to the high school. So you kind of bounced around a bit. <laughs> well, it was uh, quite a change after having spent my entire time in one building up in Lemonster and only having nuns. In sixth grade, I had my first male teacher, uh, Bob Forrest, who was a very nice man. Mm -hmm. but it was uh, strange having a man as a teacher. Yeah. So, and on to Natick High. Natick High School, class of 64. And what was that like? Well, it was a big class, a uh, big school then. Uh, there were, I think, close to 1,500 kids in just three grades. And I was a little bit of a shy kid. I didn't have a whole lot of uh, friends. I had a lot of neighborhood friends that I could see, but uh, among my own classmates, I had a small core of people that I hung with, but uh, I didn't really know everybody in the class. Even to this day, I, I see some of them on Facebook, and uh, I I'd be surprised if some of them would have any recollections of me at all, because we just mm -hmm. didn't do stuff together. Were you thinking about joining the military then? No, I had no uh, premonition at all of uh, ever joining the military while I was in high school. It wasn't on my radar at all. Okay, so you went to UMass Amherst. I got accepted uh, in the spring of 64 and went to uh, UMass. Uh, I was classified 2S by the uh, draft board, the Selective mm -hmm. Service, which meant I had four years to finish my degree. That was the, the rule back then. Mm -hmm. And what did you major in? Majored in mathematics. Uh, I knew uh, right from day one what I wanted to study. Uh, I was fairly good at it, and mm -hmm. uh, I knew I wanted to become a teacher. Uh, mm -hmm. During my freshman year, I uh, tutored a couple of my uh, dorm mates in calculus, and I just discovered that I had a knack for explaining things, and uh, so I knew I wanted to be a teacher. And again, before the interview, you were telling me about you were at UMass during a very interesting period when mm -hmm. it just expanded beyond belief. Can you mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about that? Well, when I went there, it was uh, there were still vestiges of uh, what it used to be called Mass Aggie, mm -hmm. Massachusetts Agricultural College. Uh, there was the Stockbridge uh, Agricultural School. Uh, but during the time I was there, 64 to 68, uh, massive numbers of buildings, dormitories, uh, libraries, uh, administrative buildings were built, football field, mm -hmm. brand new field was built, uh, principally because of uh, one man, the president of the school, who really lobbied heavily for lots of money for the state university. Mm -hmm. And uh, not only was it growing in terms of size, but uh, of course during that time it also grew in terms of uh, the anti-war movement. I don't want to get ahead of the game, but uh, certainly that also grew during that time period. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now it's 1968? 68 when I graduated, yeah. Okay, and w was that Army right afterward? Yes, uh, I was in ROTC for mm -hmm. two years, which was required at uh, the University of Massachusetts because of 
the fact that it was a moral land grant college. Mm -hmm. And actually during that two year ROTC stint, I underwent uh, as a part of the training a regular standard uh, army induction physical. We were put on a bus and driven to Springfield. So I had the physical. And I get the feeling that uh, because of that and my entrance in ROTC, my name was sort of on the radar to the local draft board. Mm -hmm. So when I graduated from UMass, I was pretty confident that I was going to be drafted. I was in good health. I had nothing else to delay or defer service. Mm -hmm. And so you were drafted. Well, I was going to be, but uh, I was able to enlist under a special program. Uh, I remember signing the enlistment papers in Malden, mm -hmm. and uh, it was soon after that that I actually got my draft notice. Uh, the paperwork hadn't caught up, so I went and you know, told the uh, Framingham Draft Board. Uh, I showed them my enlistment papers and said, okay, well, you can ignore the draft notice. Uh, that might have been a pretty critical thing because if I had been drafted, I probably would have been sent to Fort Dix and then to uh, Fort Benning for infantry training, which mm -hmm. is what most draftees would have gotten. By enlisting, I was able to choose uh, a branch. I enlisted under, very, under a very, very special program that was offered only to college graduates. Mm -hmm. uh, I enlisted uh, with uh, an absolute guarantee of being accepted to uh, officer candidate school. And you had to choose one of three branches uh, for that. It either had to be infantry, uh, engineering, or artillery. And I chose artillery. Mm -hmm. What made you choose artillery? Well, uh, I had heard uh, and seen on TV what happened to infantry soldiers. They were mm -hmm. in the thick of the fighting, obviously, and the most chance to get hurt. Engineering, after talking with a few people, sounded like, at least for an enlisted person, it would be a lot of digging ditches and filling sandbags, and that mm -hmm. didn't sound very appealing. Artillery had the chance of perhaps uh, being able to use some of my mathematical skills, and so I opted for that one. So after you enlisted, you were on your way to Fort Leonard Wood. That is correct. Uh, mm -hmm. July, I think it was late July, uh, 1968, I got on an airplane for the very first time in my mm -hmm. life. I had never been on one. And flew out to Fort Leonard Wood for eight weeks of basic training. And what was that like? Well, the training was pretty much like uh, you've seen in the movies. Uh, drill instructors doing a, yell a lot of yelling and the recruits doing a lot of marching and calisthenics and push-ups and going to the rifle range and uh, pulling KP and cleaning barracks and polishing shoes, mm -hmm. run-of-the-mill stuff. And what happened afterward? A uh, few days after uh, finishing basic training, uh, I, along with uh, the rest of the um, people who had opted for artillery, were put on a bus and we were driven to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And I went through eight weeks of advanced training there. I, had, I didn't realize it when I enlisted, but there were actually two different major uh, jobs, they call them MOS in the Army, uh, that artillery had. One would be that you would be on the gun, actually on the whatever the weapon was. And the other one was called fire direction. And luckily I was put in fire direction because that was where I could actually use some of my math skills. Mm -hmm. A fire direction would be the people in, that it would be in a, a tent maybe 50 yards away from the gun and we would get the fire mission over the radios and we would calculate on the map and charts mm -hmm. and other stuff exactly how to aim the gun. Okay. So you're finished with artillery training in Oklahoma. Right. That was in about mid of late October, early November 1968. And did you know at the time you were going to be sent to Vietnam? Well, I suspected strongly, but uh, I spent the next couple of months on temporary duty at uh, Fort Sill, which was actually, except for a couple of days when I had to pull KP, uh, not too bad. I spent mm -hmm. a couple of weeks uh, working in a finance office, uh, making ledger entries, uh, again, because of uh, my skill mm -hmm. with numbers, I was assigned there came home for Christmas uh, in 1968, and when I got back to Fort Sill in early January, 
uh, the orders had been cut and I was told I'd be going over. So 1969, you're heading to Vietnam? After uh, 30, I, well, I spent another few weeks at Sill and then 30 days leave, and mm -hmm. it was the first week in March okay. when I headed out to Fort Lewis, Washington for processing. Mm -hmm. And how did you get to Vietnam? Well, we got on a plane. Um, there were about 250 uh, GIs. Uh, I would venture to say I was probably on the older end. I was, at that time, almost 23 years old, just about a month short mm -hmm. of being 23. And most of the other guys looked like they were 18, 19, 20-year-olds. There were one or two uh, men older in their late mm -hmm. 20s or early 30s, but just about everybody was pretty young. We took off. We flew first to uh, Hawaii. We landed at Honolulu to... Uh, apparently do some refueling. They didn't even let us off the plane. Mm -hmm. We just landed quickly and then took off again. Then we flew to from there to Guam and then found the last leg from Guam to Vietnam. Okay. And what rank did you hold at the time? At that time I was a uh, private first class. I was E3. Uh, I had been, uh, I guess it was just private with one stripe E2 mm -hmm. coming out of uh, advanced training and after that few months at Fort Sill I had been promoted to uh, private first class. Okay. So tell us about the first days of Vietnam. <laughs> well I landed uh, in a place called Cameron which mm -hmm. is on Cameron Bay about halfway between the DMZ and uh, the Delta. Mm -hmm. I didn't know it uh, at the time, I don't know if anyone else on the plane did, but Cameron was probably one of the safest places uh, in South Vietnam. If I'm not mistaken, I believe uh, one of the presidents actually made a short visit to Vietnam and stopped in Cameron. It was the only place that was deemed safe enough for a presidential visit. Mm -hmm. uh, I was there for about a week and we got all sorts of um, uh, equipment. Uh, a lot of indoctrination talks and we would do calisthenics and marching every day uh, just to get us ready. And then what happened? Well, uh, after the week, uh, a few of us were put on the back of a um, giant C-130 transport plane. This is one of those planes where the front opens up and you can actually drive a tank on board. And we were flown um, south uh, to Benoit, which was where the uh, military had established a very large uh, both army and air base. Can you spell that? B-I-E-N-H-O-A. And where would that be in Vietnam? I believe it was located about 20 miles northeast of Saigon. Okay. okay, and what happened then? Well, I got off uh, the plane and was put on a jeep and driven across the base to a little shack that had a sign out in front that said 7th Battalion, 8th Field Artillery. And that was the unit where I was assigned. That was the battalion headquarters. Mm -hmm. And that particular battalion had three batteries, uh, Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie. And they were at different locations uh, around uh, South Vietnam around mm -hmm. the, uh, s that sector and I spent maybe about another week at Benoit. They you know, did a little fine-tuning on some of the skills we had learned. Uh, on the States you usually trained on uh, 105s or 155s. Mm -hmm. uh, those are millimeter guns. But uh, the 7th Battalion had uh, rather large guns. They had 175 and 8 inch much larger and there were a few different uh, standard operating procedures that they wanted to make certain we were aware of before we went over, before we went out to the field. Mm -hmm. After the uh, one week there, I was put in a Jeep and we driven, oh, maybe about 50 or 60 miles uh, southwest and I was assigned to Alpha Battery. And at that time, Alpha Battery was 
located just outside a little village called Ben Luck. Uh, when I say little, I mean really tiny. It wasn't even a dot on most maps. It was maybe five or six huts in the form of a circle. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Alpha Battery had established a position maybe a couple hundred yards further on down the trail from them. Okay. So up to this point, until you were actually in Vietnam, what have you heard about the Vietnam War up to that point? Well, we'd seen stuff on TV, obviously. We'd seen mm -hmm. um, most of the stuff you saw was the, some of the heavier action, firefights, tracer rounds, mm -hmm. uh, uh, B-52 bombing runs. Um, that's the stuff that makes the big splash on TV. Mm -hmm. uh, where I was, uh, didn't see a lot of that. We got our share of uh, mortar rounds and rocket propelled grenades tossed at us, but none of the, the, the big stuff that you might have seen on TV. Uh, didn't know really what to expect. Uh, it was kind of mm -hmm. hard to you know, know what to think about. You didn't try to interact too much with the local civilians. You really you weren't allowed to that much. Mm -hmm. Uh, we had a perimeter set up, and it was very rare that any civilian would come inside of that. So. And how many uh, fellow, um, <clears throat> how many were in your battalion at the time? Uh, I don't know about the whole battalion, but mm -hmm. in uh, the battery where I was, I'd estimate we had between 150 and 180 guys. Did you, did you become friends with any of them? Mostly. Uh, the ones that were in the fire direction center, there were two uh, five-man teams uh, that would uh, pull 12-hour shifts. You'd be 12 on, 12 off. Mm -hmm. And then every week you would switch and uh, take the other 12 hours, mm -hmm. which was a little rough on the body. You'd mm -hmm. go from 6 in the morning to 6 at night, and then in the course of a 24-hour period, you'd switch to 6 at night to 6 in the morning. So it was, uh, I don't know why they did that, but that was the way it was done. I didn't really get to know too many of the guys who were actually on the guns. They were, of course, uh, surrounding uh, the bunker where I was. And uh, you'd, you'd say hi to some of them. You'd see them in uh, the mess tent eating uh, food or something, but didn't really get too close to them. It was the, the guys you actually worked with that were the ones you got close to. Okay. And uh, you were mentioning mortar rounds a little bit earlier. Hmm. Were you ever in direct uh, line of fire with the enemy? Well, I never had hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat. I didn't mm -hmm. personally fire a weapon at the enemy, but we had our share of uh, incoming rounds uh, coming at us. Mm -hmm. I made the mistake one time of uh, sending a picture home uh, to my folks. It's where a uh, rocket propelled grenade had blown out a small corner of uh, a building and uh, I, my dad sort of mentioned that you, you know you don't want to have your mother looking at this kind of stuff. Mm. Uh, I remember one time waking up the next morning after a particular night of uh, uh, attack and we went outside and we had a, uh, a truck that used to carry some of the uh, rounds, mm -hmm. artillery rounds, and the thing looked like Swiss cheese and it had so many holes in it. Uh, so we, we had our share of uh, attacks. To be honest, it wasn't uh, really that, that dangerous as long as you stayed inside the bunker. The mm -hmm. bunkers were fairly heavily protected with a lot of sandbags. I know that for a fact because I spent a lot of time filling them. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you stayed inside and kept your head down, you usually were pretty safe. Okay. Uh, were any members of your unit or battery wounded? Actually, in the first month I was there, uh, one of the newer guys, he was even newer than I was, was out on the perimeter on guard mm -hmm. duty. And uh, he failed to put on his flak jacket for protection and a mortar round went off in front of him and uh, he was wounded very severely. Mm -hmm. They brought him inside our bunker and uh, our medic couldn't do anything for him and they, uh, Lieutenant called for a dust off uh, helicopter to come in and get him. 
and I was one of the ones that helped uh, uh, carry him out to the helicopter and put him on the helicopter. We got word later on that he had uh, died before he could get to the MASH unit. So that was, uh, that was a real wake-up call mm -hmm. in the first month. And how long were you, um, <clears throat> how long were you in that particular uh, station? Well, it, we were supposed to ro uh, rotate around. Uh, the battalion's uh, method of operation had been to rotate every month or so, but as it turned out, we stayed in Ben Luck, or just outside Ben Luck, for four and a half, almost five months. Uh, eventually, during the, the final f uh, few weeks that we were there, action died down quite a bit because we had pretty much secured most of that area. Mm -hmm. Did you ever, um, when you were stationed over there, did you get updates about what was going on? Well, there was no uh, public communication. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that there was a an English television station out of Saigon, um, AFVN 11. It was the Armed Forces uh, Vietnamese Network, Channel 11. But uh, the only person who had a TV in our unit was our commanding officer, the captain. He had a small little miniature TV and uh, he kept it in his private bunker. Uh, so the only outside communication we would get would be every now and then we'd get a copy of Stars and Stripes, which is the military newspaper. And needless to say, everything that was put in there was heavily censored. Mm -hmm. And uh, you might get some bits and pieces of information from letters home. People mm -hmm. would say things are going on or uh, war protest is increasing and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. But you didn't get firsthand knowledge of it uh, where we were. Okay, so what happened after four and a half, five months? Well, at that point, uh, we then sort of became a traveling road show. Uh, our mission was direct support of the 199th Light Infantry, 82nd Airborne, and the 1st Royal Australian Task Force. There were Australian troops in our area. And uh, for a couple of months, a uh, number of those units were uh, moving from place to place to try to secure more areas. And the general setup would be this. We would go and convoy everybody, the infantry troops, our, our unit, the artillery, and we'd get to a position. Uh, minesweepers would uh, clear out uh, and make sure there were no mines. If you were lucky, you might get a, a CB unit, construction battalion, to come in and maybe clear out the jungle a little bit. Then all of us would move in, would set up a perimeter, uh, built basically what's called a, a fire support base. And uh, we would stay there maybe a week or two weeks. The infantry units would go out on forays into the jungle and uh, if they needed support, they'd radio and we would fire supporting rounds. And these were places that uh, literally had no name. They had uh, military names. It was fire support base, uh, Verna, so fire support base, uh, Cobra, fire support base this, fire support base that. Mm -hmm. uh, they were places that uh, as soon as we left, I'm certain the locals came in and just uh, took all the sandbags and any other uh, stuff that was left behind and used it for their own purposes. Mm -hmm. So we were uh, literally on the road. Um, I spent a good deal of time uh, either sleeping outdoors or sleeping uh, mm -hmm. uh, under a jeep or uh, very often, uh, you know, you'd have no place that you could really stay. Uh, sometimes we'd try to build a makeshift uh, mm -hmm. building out of some sandbags or something, but you wouldn't stay there long enough to build mm -hmm. any permanent structures. Which brings me, us to the next question. Did you uh, feel that you had adequate equipment, adequate supplies? We always had uh, uh, adequate uh, munitions, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. One thing we had uh, plenty of also was uh, cigarettes. Uh, Camel provided free cigarettes for most of the soldiers. Of course, once they got you hooked, when you came back home, you were, uh, that's how my dad started smoking. Uh, I luckily never uh, got hooked bad enough. I was able to stop as soon as I came home. As far as other stuff, food was okay. It was, you know, when we were in 
uh, permanent positions. We had regular hot food that was cooked, but out in the field we would have sea rations, and you know they were edible, and mm -hmm. you could live on those. Uh, water was sometimes a little scarce; to, they'd have to bring a truck in with some uh, water. Sometimes you wouldn't be able to shower for a while. Yeah. What about uh, medical supplies? Well, we had a medic who was with us, and uh, I never heard him complain about being mm -hmm. short of supplies. We had a few occasions when they'd have to be um, be used. The mm -hmm. soldier I told you about who was wounded. Right. Uh, we had a couple of civilians one time that came in, uh, a woman who uh, and her son who uh, lived in a hut right near our position, and apparently uh, VC came by and threw a hand grenade in the hut, and some fragments had uh, wounded them. The little kid had some fragments in his buttocks, and uh, the lady was missing part of a toe, and they came to us to get medical help because really we were the only ones that had any sort of good medical help. She couldn't go to a local doctor. She might mm -hmm. get, uh, you know, injected with Vaseline or anything, God knows what. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't have real medical doctors there on the mm -hmm. countryside. Okay. So, um, given the weather conditions, you know, <laughs> generally hot, humid. There were uh, two basic conditions. It was hot and wet and hot and dry. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was hot either way. And, during the dry season, everything just turned bone dry. And, and during the rainy season, uh, the water got so deep uh, that you would need, and the mud so bad that in any built up position, we used to try to get uh, wooden pallets mm -hmm. so that you could get from place to place without sinking in the mud. Uh, and we also had ditches on the sides of uh, the roads that would uh, fill up with water during the rainy season. And then, of course, they would dry out during the mm -hmm. dry season. Sometimes a bit uncomfortable. Well, you never had any need for winter clothing, I can tell you that. Uh, the clothing we had was comfortable enough. Okay. Uh, what about your superiors? Uh, did they provide adequate leadership or adequate uh, I'm guidance? certain everybody had um, different stories about uh, different officers. We had some some young lieutenants and, of course, a captain who would uh, lead us in charge of the battery. I remember one lieutenant who I didn't think very much of. I thought he was uh, arrogant and didn't know what he was doing. The best officer uh, that I served under was a young 19-year-old lieutenant, a real 90-day wonder. He was uh, right off of an Indiana farm, farm mm -hmm. boy. Graduated from high school, went through OCS. His name was Chris Kinman, and he was a terrific dynamite leader. Mm -hmm. uh, and more so because of the group he was in charge of. Um, he was one of the two lieutenants for the two fire direction teams, and the one that I was on was four college graduates, four smart mouth college punks, and this uh, hick from Indiana in charge of him. But, uh, uh, we knew enough to behave, and uh, Chris immediately earned our respect as mm -hmm. a never did anything, uh, never told us to do anything that he wasn't uh, willing to do himself and mm -hmm. did himself. He was right in there with us all the way. Okay. Let's get back to the traveling road show. When did this uh, phase end? Well, let's see, it lasted a few months. Uh, we then spent about a month. Um, near a, a place called Nuidat, N-U-I-D-A-T. That was um, in support of the First Royal Australian Task Force. We were actually uh, set up right beside one of their makeshift runways, mm -hmm. and we got a chance to interact with some of the Australian uh, guys. They were all uh, volunteers. There were no draftees in the Australian Army. And they were a very wild bunch. They were. Uh, uh, willing to do just about anything and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, what made it uh, very interesting was is that they uh, authorized beer in the mess hall. So uh, when you ate with them, uh, every now and then we would go and eat with them. Uh, you could get beer, which you obviously couldn't get in a <laughs> um, uh, U.S. military mess hall. So that was an uh, interesting time. I should say so. How long were you hanging out with the Australians? 
Well, we were there approximately about a month, I mm -hmm. guess, and uh, you know, most of the time we were where we were by ourselves, but every now and then we'd get to go across to the other side of the airfields, uh, the airstrip, and go over to their side and sit in with them, and mm -hmm. uh, that's actually where we would go if we wanted to get a shower, because uh, we didn't have any shower facilities where we were, so. Beer and showers. <laughs> <laughs> Great amenities. Uh, not, uh, not pleasant being without a shower for a long period mm. of time, so. All right, what happened after that? Well, after that, uh, we were reassigned to Benoit. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't mention, but Benoit was one of the busier airports, actually, in the world back then. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the uh, munitions and supplies that uh, dealt with the war would go through Benoit, and mm -hmm. it was also a major spot for a lot of troops to come in, land, and take off from. So because of that, uh, the enemy very often would uh, mortar it or send rocket-propelled grenades. It would be a big coup for them to tear up a chunk of runway or maybe mm -hmm. hit a plane and something like that. So they always had a, a unit of infantry and a unit of artillery there to protect the airstrip, the airfield. And this particular uh, time, I guess that was about almost nine months into my year, uh, we were assigned there. for a while. And was there any incidents? Well, we had uh, a number of incidents. Uh, one in particular, I, rem I remember I was in a mess line, chow line and breakfast, and we started uh, taking some uh, rounds. And I remember running with a buddy uh, to get back to the FDC bunker so we could start firing our defensive rounds back. But it was about 200 yards of running, and uh, you could see the uh, mortar rounds flying overhead. Wow. And uh, we were just very lucky that mm -hmm. nothing happened to us, and we got back there and just mm -hmm. uh, managed to quell the attack. We fired our defensive rounds, and the attack stopped. So now we're heading into 1970 or already into it? Uh, just about. Uh, mm -hmm. That was probably, I'm going to say, early January of 1970, yeah. Okay. And what happened after that? Well, after that particular incident, uh, I sort of had a little chat with myself and um, said, I, I've got to start taking a little bit more care. and. That was not a, a smart thing to do, running around like that. So I put in for an R&R. &R. I had originally thought not to do it. I was just going to do my year tour of duty and uh, go home. Mm -hmm. But I thought I needed to get away for a while. And we were entitled to take one, just put your name on the list. So I went to the clerk, and I, battery clerk, and I put my name on the list. And uh, a few weeks later, I got the word I was going to Tokyo. So it was, I guess, late February, mid to late February. I took off from uh, Benoit and was uh, actually driven to an Air Force base called Tonsonut mm -hmm. and uh, flew from there to Tokyo and spent uh, about five or six days in Tokyo. I hope you had a good time. Mm -hmm. Well, the. The first day and a half, uh, I couldn't tell you very much about it. I was drunk. Mm -hmm. I uh, found a buddy uh, who was also there in R&R, &R. Uh, well, someone I, I, I didn't know, but he was uh, in the military, and we, two of us just sat there and uh, downed drinks all night, and I went back up to my room afterwards and uh, slept it off. Then I called home. I remember uh, my dad when I got back home saying, did you know that phone call cost $109? Because this was 1970, and I reversed the charges, obviously. He was happy to pay for it just to hear from us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, then after I sobered up and, and uh, got myself back on my feet, I did a little sightseeing, and I got to, went to the Ginza, and. Uh, Went to a bowling alley just to see how the Japanese do it, and uh, went to the Imperial Palace and did some shopping and 
uh, rode on their trains, that very terrific train system over there, and uh, got my mind clear. Mm -hmm. So you had an R&R &R in Tokyo, and yeah. you're back to Vietnam? When I got uh, back, I officially had, I believe at that point, uh, about 14 days to go mm -hmm. before I was slated to go home. And I didn't uh, know it at the time, but while I was in Tokyo, two things happened that affected uh, my unit. One was that the uh, captain that I had known, his year had ended. Mm -hmm. and he went home and there was a brand new captain who I hadn't met yet. And the other was is that my unit had picked up and moved out. Uh, Air Force uh, spotters had uh, uncovered a portion of the Ho Chi Minh Trail uh, near a region called the Parrot's Beak region, which is near the Cambodian border. And these, uh, this portion of the trail consisted of uh, highly camouflaged but very solid and secured uh, concrete bunkers. And as such, they needed uh, the big guns to go in and blow them up. And we had the biggest guns the Army had, mm -hmm. eight-inch uh, guns. Mm -hmm. So my unit was called, uh, called up, and they were sent out to the Parrot's Beak region. And uh, they were out there when I finally got back uh, to Benoit. Now, as far as... Uh, my personal story from that point, uh, I was extraordinarily lucky. I got there, I went to battalion headquarters, and I said, I'm just back from r and &R. I understand my battery's out near the Cambodian border. So they got on the radio, and I spoke with the battery clerk, and uh, he went and he spoke with the captain and came back on the radio and said, I got two good pieces of news for you. One is you've got a six-day drop. That meant I was going home six days earlier mm -hmm. than my official date. And the other was that uh, the captain said, it's just one week left for you, so why don't you just stay in Benoit? So I got to spend the final week in the relative safety of uh, mm -hmm. a fairly built-up place. Very so, lucky indeed. Very, uh, as it turns out, extraordinarily lucky. Mm -hmm. And. Your luck seemed to continue when you were finally shipped back home because uh, you were telling me earlier that you didn't have to face anti-war protesters. Tell us about that. Yeah, I was, um, we flew out of, we left Vietnam and mm -hmm. uh, stopped in Hawaii for some refueling and we landed in uh, Southern California. But rather than landing at a regular airport, we mm -hmm. landed at the Oakland Army Base and of course they weren't going to allow any protesters on an army base. Mm -hmm. So I was fortunate to not have to face any of that. I mm -hmm. uh, spent a couple of days processing out there. Uh, they give you a chance to get, take a nice shower and give you a good meal. And uh, They sit you down in a room and give you an indoctrination talk. They want to know how many of you are willing to or would like to re-enlist. Of course <laughs> nobody raised their hand. Um, and then they put us on a bus uh, we were in uniform, our brand new, nice spiffy green Class A's, and they drove us over to San Francisco Airport. And there might have been some protesters there, but they hustled us right onto the plane before uh, we mm -hmm. could get uh, accosted by any of them. And uh, flew back to Boston, and luckily when we landed in Boston it was about 11, 11.30 at night. And by that time, all the protesters had left Logan Airport. Mm -hmm. So it was just my mom and dad. So I was extraordinarily fortunate to not have to face any of that mm -hmm. uh, stuff. And your mom and dad were actually at a function. Yeah, that, uh, that very night, they were attending a um, uh, dinner uh, for the disabled American veterans. They were actually honoring a man named Bob Reddish. Mm -hmm. And uh, my dad was the commander of the local uh, post here in Natick, mm -hmm. DAV post. And about halfway through or near the end of the ceremony, they were, uh, they had to leave and get over to Logan. And the MC uh, said something, I think we ought to give uh, Seth Tiberio and his wife Grace a hand. They're going to the airport to pick up their son who's coming back from Vietnam. And, 
I remember my dad being proud about that and, um, as they walked out. Okay, you're back home. No wounds or anything like that. Uh, very lucky, no wounds, no. Okay, so tell us what happened afterward. Well, I came home. Uh, I took uh, one day to go back out to UMass for a brief moment. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and then I came back home. Uh, thought I'd be able to relax for a while, but I think it was four or five days after I'd gotten home, mm -hmm. I was a substitute math teacher at Ashland High School. Uh, apparently, uh, I did an okay job. I didn't kill any children or anything, so <laughs> they asked me back, and uh, they actually eventually offered me a job. They one of a couple of schools that offered me a job. So. So, and you ended up teaching at Wellesley. Uh, after doing some uh, substituting and part-time teaching at a couple of places, I've been at Wellesley for the past 40 years, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what's that been like? Yeah. Uh, it's been interesting. I've uh, uh, seen a lot of uh, different kinds of kids along the way, and mm -hmm. uh, I enjoy mathematics, and I enjoy being with children, so it's been, a, mm -hmm. uh, been an enjoyable experience. Um, when my son graduated from college, he mentioned something very poignant to me. He, I, I think it was, uh, this is what he said. He said, I don't ever remember you saying you were going to work. Uh, he was talking about when he was a kid. Uh, he said, you, you always said you were going to school. And he was sharp enough to pick up on the distinction. Mm -hmm. Some people have a job. Other people will go and do something they like. Mm -hmm. And I like what I'm doing, so. Okay. So uh, just getting back from Vietnam, and of course you're heading right into the heart of anti, the anti-war uh, protests. 1970. So um, you made no mention of the fact that you just come back from Vietnam. I didn't tell, uh, outside of the family, no one would have known. Mm -hmm. uh, I, it just wasn't something you said. I put my uniform in the closet and actually didn't even touch it for about seven years until I uh, joined the VFW here in Natick. Mm -hmm. Have you joined any other organizations? No, I just joined the VFW and I was a uh, senior vice commander for one year. And, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, to be a commander required much more of a time commitment. I was too mm -hmm. involved with what I was doing at school. Okay. So uh, tell me a little bit about your brother who was also, I believe, in the Army during the uh, Vietnam era? Yeah, he graduated from Natick High in 71. Mm -hmm. And what's his name? Stephen. Stephen. I think it was 71. And he went off to, um, uh, I apologize, he graduated in 70 because it was right after he was accepted that they had the incident at Kent State. Ah, yes. Okay. And he, that's where he went, was Kent State. So he, wow. was, he showed up in September, uh, a few months after the uh, incident. Mm -hmm. And he was majoring in architecture. Uh, Kent State had an architectural school. I think he was there for two years or so, and then he, uh, for whatever reason, left. He was doing well academically, but he left and uh, got drafted mm -hmm. and spent, I think it was 73 and 74, somewhere around there. Uh, in Texas, I think it was at Fort Bliss and Fort Hood, mm -hmm. and he was trained as a mechanic. And uh, so he did the service uh, stateside. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're you're still teaching at Wellesley. I am. And either of uh, did any of your children express any interest in the military? Well, my daughter, uh, obviously, no. Mm -hmm. uh, she. She works right now in a bank, but mm -hmm. she's also a, a licensed hairdresser as well. Mm -hmm. My son did express an interest, uh, but he had uh, he had a bout with uh, some bouts with sleepwalking, and that disqualified him. However, he's made up for that mm -hmm. in uh, many ways. He now is an analyst for the Defense Department, and. Uh, he works for the Joint Warfare Analysis Center in Dahlgren, Virginia. Mm -hmm. 
And as a civilian employee, uh, about four or five years ago, he spent four months in Iraq. Mm -hmm. And uh, he never told, uh, we knew he was there, but uh, he never told my wife and I that he had to go a couple of times out to some very uh, seriously bad places, wow. take some helicopter trips out. Then after four months there, he did two more months in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And then he came home. And uh, actually, this shirt, mm -hmm. is, uh, he got me. And there's only one place in the world you can get this shirt, and that is in Marine Corps headquarters in Baghdad. Mm -hmm. It's the only place it's sold. And he had a Marine friend who he asked to go in and buy it, and he gave it to me. That's a nice looking shirt. Yeah, it's a very nice shirt. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you ever uh, have social engagements with other Vietnam veterans? or? I see uh, a few around town. Uh, uh, you mentioned Dave Jocelyn earlier. Mm -hmm. I, I know Dave. Uh, I see him at church and a few other places mm -hmm. around town. I know he's currently uh, or was actor for a while in the VFW. Mm -hmm. Uh, not really too many others. Okay. Before we end this interview, uh, first, uh, your thoughts on the current engagements in Iraq and Afghanistan? Well, uh, I was a little dubious about uh, Iraq. I, I wasn't certain that the Iraqi forces would be able to completely take over from us and do the current do the job. Uh, that we had been doing. And I'm pretty certain that Afghanistan is just a quagmire and is going to be very difficult to uh, get control over. One thing I will say that I think has changed dramatically over the years is the treatment uh, of the veteran. Um, the anti-war movement is probably as big today as it was back then, maybe not as vocal. But one thing is that even the most ardent anti-war person, at least now, will grudgingly uh, admit that the soldier is going someplace they wouldn't want to go, mm -hmm. doing something they wouldn't want to do, experiencing a lot of things they wouldn't want to experience. Mm -hmm. And that's a change from my generation where people sort of blame the individual soldier for the policies of the government. Mm -hmm. I think nowadays the anger is more directed more mm -hmm. uh, where it is. Before we finish, could I give you one brief story? That, Go right uh, ahead. About um, maybe 15 years ago, I was at a week-long conference, mathematics conference, in Connecticut. And I was checking into a dormitory on the campus, mm -hmm. and there was a man across the hall checking in too. And after we finished, we both sat down and started chewing the fat. Uh, where do you teach school, what courses, what mm -hmm. usual stuff. Conversation got around to what do you, what'd you do in the war? And uh, this man's name was Bill Willis. Didn't mm -hmm. mean a thing to me. And uh, I said I was in the artillery and Bill said, oh, wow, I was a captain in the artillery. And I said, what unit? And he said, Alpha Battery, 7th Battalion, 8th Field Artillery. I said, when did you take command? And he said, he took command in the last week in February 1970. Amazingly, I had crossed paths with the captain that I had never met, the one who uh, said that I didn't have to go out in the field. And uh, I sat there and talked with him for a while. And I talked, I wanted to know specifically about some of the people that I had worked with. And one of the men that I was working very, very closely with was the lieutenant in charge of our team. It was a young man named Bob Bates from uh, the state of Washington. And Captain Willis told me that during a particularly severe attack out near the Parrots Beak region, Lieutenant Bates was severely wounded and had to be sent home after only about four or five months in country. And I almost assuredly would have been standing right next to the man because we were working closely. Yeah, it's just an amazing coincidence to run into Bill Willis. was a math teacher at a school in Washington, uh, D.C. somewhere, and he was attending the same conference. Just that is amazing. <laughs> couldn't believe it. Anything else? I think that's about it.
And that's, a, that's an incredible way to end it. Uh, Ronald Chuck Tiberia, we thank you for your participation in the Native Veterans Oral History Project. Just some fantastic stories. Thank you. Thank you.